Um, I'm actually not a COVID-19 anymore. Currently, I'm at the Institute of Digital Games at the University of Malta. And I research and design persuasive and serious games, which in short, are games that try to change your life. And recently, I've become interested in reflection as a design perspective. So by reflection, I mean the kind of experience you have when you're surprised when you experience cognitive dissonance, when there's a gap between what you expect and what actually happens. This makes us want to make sense of this cognitive imbalance, which makes us review what we think we know, looking for more plausible explanations. Sounds pretty specific, right? Well, we reflect all the time. We reflect when we read poetry. We reflect when we discover by accident that our friends are a bit racist. We reflect when we play games, but not all games. Games that don't surprise us, or games that give us exactly what we expect, and games that completely absorb us within their experience. These kinds of games don't do what reflection is triggered by, which is dissonance. But when we look at experimental games, dissonance becomes much more common as a player experience. A game like Dysphoria creates dissonance. The way, in which is, uh, the way in which it uses conventional game tropes, but then does a bait and switch on us. Phone Story does it too, making the player be the oppressor, and consider how as consumers, they make others be the oppressed. Which got me wondering, how would you make a reflective game? This is something that you would be able to do intentionally. But there's no textbook for experimental game design that causes disturbing experience of dissonance. And as I thought about games like Liz Ryerson's um, Problematic compared to co-op mode Skipping Stones, or Heather Kelly's Lapis compared to Jake Elliott's The House in California, it was obvious that they were very different in many regards, and yet they all coexisted within a kind of reflective game space. So what was it that they all had in common? And were their designers doing some of the same kinds of things? The only way to properly answer that question, of course, is to find out directly from the designers. So that's what I did. I interviewed designers of reflective games. And it turned out that they had much more in common than not. So one aspect that everyone brought up in one way or another was subversion. And perhaps this isn't surprising, since experimental game design is considered experimental in opposition to mainstream game design. This subversion took place at multiple levels and forms. For example, for some designers, it concerned theme, what topics their games tackled. Leo Schoenfelder, who's made games about dying children, sex addiction, and how women can't have it all, she said, quote, There are a lot of politically incorrect things in my games, which I enjoy very much. Mainstream games are so cleaned up, not only visually, but also regarding gameplay um, and content. There's hardly any controversial subject matter in it, end quote. On the topic of Lapis, a game that is ostensibly about tickling a rabbit character on a Nintendo DS, but is actually about female orgasms, Heather Kelly said, quote, my goal is a little bit like a prank, and that people might be playing it who had no idea when they started that that's what it was, but it would give them useful interactive lessons without having to be graphical." End quote. Subversion often takes place mechani mechanically at the level of interaction. This form of subversion is the most impact on, on game literate people who have often grown accustomed to particular kinds of mechanics and have well-formed expectations on how games are and aren't. Pippin Barr, a frequent subverter of mechanics, has made games about waiting in a line for hours, typing into a text box to talk to a tree, 
and painting by playing the game Snake. And a disclaimer, he's also my husband. So he said, quote, it's good if there are players that grade against the player's expectations in such a way that part of what they think when they're playing is hopefully not just, this game is annoying, but also, why is this game like this? This person probably didn't just make this game to be annoying. And so that can serve as a kind of trigger that can then jump to not necessarily a realization, but at least a few thoughts about why does this game feel this way? End quote. Co-op mode, designers of skipping stones, a poetic meditation on loss, also pointed out that the, the, the kind of attention reset quality that subversive mechanics invite, they said, quote, when you take normal rules and then subvert them, it forces the player to consider what they're doing a bit more meaningfully than when you play the same types of games that have the same kinds of controls. You just jump in and start figuring stuff out right away. But when there's an unfamiliar control mechanism or scheme, it causes a bit of pause and makes you consider, like, so this isn't like other games that I've played. That paradigm shift is really important because it puts you in a different state of mind of how you conceptualize the game and how you take it in." End quote. One form of subversion that was quite common amongst the designers related to pace. They were into slow games. Jake Elliott, designer of a house in California in Kentucky Route Zero, proposed that slow games provide underexplored territory for digital games. He said, quote, slowing things down in the, in the video game, that is subversive within the form, the way the form is used most of the time. This emotional territory of the exhilarating sensation that's been really mined so well that it's coded as part of what is a video game, end quote. Co-op mode also talked about a slow frame of mind. They said, quote, we wanted the game to be completely playable with just the mouse, so that you can have tea or coffee while you're playing and create this space for yourself where you're just calm and relaxed. The pacing of the walking in the game is very deliberate and slow that will either annoy you if you're not in the right frame of mind, or it will bring you into the experience if you are. End quote. Now, subversion can be great if your players understand that what you've done is intentional, that your disregard for design standards is driven by philosophy. But players don't always understand what you've done. And this is the unfortunate flip side to doing new things. And problematic, the way that objects work at one level totally changes in the next, completely disregarding the standard user interface rule that interactive behaviors should remain consistent. And this is exactly what Liz Ryerson, designer of Problematic, intended. She wanted to represent a world that was confusing, changing, and ominous. But players frequently didn't understand this. She said, quote, people just say, wow, this is ineptly designed. Whereas you put all this effort into doing this experience that's really involved and different. They don't even think you're doing anything at all. End quote. Co-op mode observed the same problem, but put a different spin on it. They said, quote, when you mess with the expectations and with what's familiar, you'll lose a lot of people. But the people who are like, this is different, and what is it asking of me? They'll actually engage with it in a deeper or more meaningful way because their attention is suddenly alert and they're trying to figure out what's different. End quote. So normally when we discuss replayability in terms of games, the discussion revolves around mechanics and the ability for the game to generate more experience. But usually we mean roughly more of the same kind of experience. The designers I talked to alluded to a different form of replayability, born from game concepts and experiences that could be, and often were expected to be, interpreted in multiple ways. 
in order for the games they came from to be more deeply understood. Sometimes this is achieved by intentionally creating dissonance between gameplay and representation and any specific meaning. Ian Bogos, designer of A Slow Year, a collection of four game poems for the Atari. He provides a book of computer-generated poetry alongside the game to invite multiplicity of meaning. He said, quote, one of the ideas behind doing this was to offer these interpretive hooks. You might ignore them, but you might consult these generated haiku that I've made as a way of introducing a new vision or inroad into the work for yourself either because you were bored with your own interpretations, or as a way of seeing some of those replay experiences that it took to reconsider it from a different perspective without having to invent that perspective on your own." End quote. Co-op mode directly included poetry in their game while thinking about how people are likely to play it in short bursts. So they said, quote, the poetry is this grounding and contextualizing factor in the game. It's written in such a way that it can be read in any order, and each line of poetry is self-contained, and tells its own story or its own visual metaphor. Ideally, through multiple playthroughs, you get different lines of poetry, so you're in a different interpretation of what the game space or the game world is trying to say. End quote. Doug Wilson approaches multiplicity and interpretation in a different way. He does this by having an open rule system essentially with holes in it. He said, quote, All the time people come up with weird improvisations or physical improvisations that are kind of clever. That's the nice thing about a game like that with a somewhat open rule system. The whole point of the game is trying to get people to make up their own house rules and bring something of their own to the game. End quote. We associate games with rule systems, and usually transparent ones. But there's a magic that can be created by not giving everything away, by holding back on how exactly things work. In Pip and Bar's art game, the surface level objective for the player, who is being an artist, is to produce a number of artworks that please a curator character. But while playing, it's never made clear what constitutes a desirable snake painting or what kind of player, what kind of playing of space for corresponds to noteworthy dancing for the curator. In fact, this is determined randomly. But anecdotal feedback from players shows that they read much more into the curator's decisions. In one case, a wife telling her husband, who was failing to make pleasing art, that the curator seemed to like her large circular works. So a lot of game design advice boils down to this. Find a cool mechanic, build some more rules around it. And Brandon spoke about this just minutes ago. But interestingly, basically none of the designers I spoke to, I spoke to described their process as being mechanics first. They described focusing on a player experience first. For example, on how problematic originated, Liz Ryerson said, quote, the original seed of the idea was something that was very disturbing. You couldn't exactly explain why. There are all these different experiences, traumatizing experiences. They're recorded in time, and those are the different rooms. The way that you look at them and contextualize them always seems to change depending on where you're coming from and what angle. Ian Bogos also imagines the experience before figuring out the gameplay. About a slow year, he said, quote, I wanted that process of attention to be the primary experience. It came about looking, mostly about looking and watching, the idea of a particular kind of experience, a particular kind of attention, and especially the juxtaposition of watching and not acting most of the time on a system that partly introduced twitchy action games, and it certainly is best known for those kinds of games. Designers also talked about a kind of 
game ethos that arose in game projects that drove their design decisions, rather than, say, purely thinking about what would make the game better. Recalling a conversation with design partner Tomas Comenci about Kentucky Route Zero, Jake Elliott said, quote, Tomas said something like, should we explain those changes that happen, or should it just happen? I said, well, not explaining it is the kind of thing we would do. It's OK. Co-op mode talked about how skipping stones' as ethos steered them away from more user-friendly features, such as the ability to record generated game sounds. Quote, we purposely chose to push that ephemeral feeling of you can only hear the soundscape once in your life when you play this game. I think that gets people to come back to it to see what differences the sound will have." End quote. But at the same time, they acknowledged that following a game's ethos over standard practice can be upsetting for players. Quote, I feel like the ephemerality upsets people because they're not used to games that don't give them what they want. I think it stays true to the design of the game in terms of loss, in terms of melancholy, that's a dark and sad approach, and that's hard for a lot of people to get into, maybe. End quote. Focusing on experience takes us to mechanics that might not give us what we want, but as the old saying goes, there's freedom and constraints. Something that I was initially surprised by, but made more sense as I thought about it, was how frequently these designers were ultimately making autobiographical games, which Kara brought up yesterday. And they're frequently based on darker aspects of life. On the subject of where the idea for skipping stones came from, Salim from Co-op Mode said, quote, a few years ago, a close friend of mine took his own life, and I was also going through a breakup and so I'd take these walks up a mountain in Montreal. Experiences of solitude, but being in nature and having a small escape from the city, all those feelings really struck a chord with me. I started thinking about, I started thinking of skipping stones as an exploration of those feelings, end quote. Said Lewis Frierson about problematic, quote, a lot of what informed it is my own experiences of having a traumatizing childhood and trying to make sense of that. It's just the way that I see the world. There's a lot of pain, darkness, and unpleasantness, and just confusion." End quote. On Perfect Woman, Leia Schoenfelder explains, quote, the idea for this game came when I was an artist and resident at the UCLA Game Lab. I wanted to be the good girlfriend and the nice tourist on one side. On the other hand, I wanted to spend as much time as I could at the game lab to get to know people and to make games. This inspired me. This overall conflict we have in our lives if we want to be perfect in all different aspects. End quote. Of course, not everyone was wanting to explore troubling experiences. About a house in California, Jake Elliott said, quote, the game is about early childhood memories of mine, and specifically related to my two grandmothers and two great-grandmothers. And what I remember about my time with them when I was younger, end quote. In all of these autobiographical games, there's a kind of meaningful, relatable resonance. You can feel human experience deeply embedded with it. Perhaps this is also a quality of the subject matter these designers are tackling. Certainly no big studio is in a race to make a game about remembering your grandmother. Yet we're all much more likely to remember our grandmothers than to recall those days of being a gangster, a soldier, or a zombie. Paradoxically, our ability to directly empathize with these more mundane situations makes them more memorable. Everyone who I spoke to had some kind of art connection. They had been to art school, 
or they have a deep interest in some form of art, whether this be poetry, music, or film. Poetry in particular surfaced in almost everyone's work in one way or another. Poetry is often understood as a defamiliarization of language, as a means of making familiar language unfamiliar. Of course, this shares roots with the general idea of subversion, which featured in everyone's work. But for several designers, they specifically invoked the role of poetry and drew a direct connection between poetry and games. Said Ian Bogos of a, On a Slow Year, quote, you know when you read a poem that it's trying to trick you. You assume that there are subtexts and symbolism and four matters. You can't really rush through it like you can skim through prose. There's this deep condensation of meaning and form in poetry, very similar to games. Not just games like a slow year, but games of many kinds, where a particular gesture or move might be incredibly overdetermined. You find yourself returning to it, and focusing on it, and reflecting on it, and practicing it. This is as true of Street Fighter as it is of a slow year, maybe more true of Street Fighter, in fact." End quote. Jake Elliott spoke about wanting to create poetic feeling experiences in a house in California. He said, quote, It's modeled after these old point-and-click adventure games in some ways. It's about having an inventory of verbs. Instead of having those verbs be really useful about acting on an environment, I was thinking about them as being more poetic. The verbs are things like remember or forget instead of pick up or push or take. End quote. Come up mode talked about how people experience their work as poetic. They said, quote, people who are into poetry, into literature, were surprised by the affordances of the game as a medium for poetry. Skipping stones would light a bulb in their head, like this art form has expressive capabilities that I hadn't thought of before. How can I apply that to my own work? Or how can I find other games that give me these sorts of experience that I didn't know I wanted until I found out about them? End quote. Other designers were making use of poetic distance in the sense of metaphors and other forms of meaning transformation. Liz Ryerson talked about how abstract representation intensifying her game experience, creating an intentional destabilizing effect. She said, quote, it wouldn't have the same effect if it wasn't in those abstract symbols, because there's something very eerie about them. They get to a place inside you where you don't exactly know why it's doing that, end quote. Others still place artistry, and by that I mean the making of art in the hands of players. In our game, Pip and Barr explicitly sought to recontextualize how players view regular game mechanics. He said, quote, I wanted to give people the buzz of realizing the process of showing something to people and hearing what they think. Something as simple as snake could be like drawing a picture, or space war is like dancing. We're always creating these aesthetic experiences through play, and you can't think of games in that way. So instead of just doing what you're supposed to do, you're also expressing yourself." End quote. Doug Wilson talked about performance and spectacle as central to Joust. He said, quote, It's a game, but it's also a performance. It's a spectator thing, an interactive music thing. I never show this game without sound and music. End quote. Another aspect that drew most of these designers together and was kind of surprising, given that they're experimental game designers, is that they design for accessibility in one way or another, which resonates with what Brandon talked about too. Said Pippin Barr about his games, quote, I make games for everybody. I make games that are functional for all. I test my game with my parents, end quote. Salim of Co-op Mode said, I really wanted people, like anybody who has no experience with games, to be able to figure it out and to be able to play it and to not feel pressured by the game. 
Accessibility has a lot of definitions when you're making games. What we mean when we say accessibility is that anybody who has the time can essentially play it. End quote. Ian Bogos reminds us that simple mechanics can feature in complex experiences. About the mechanics of a slow year, he said, quote, they're dead simple. If you made a mechanical reductionist observation, you would say that the game is really about pressing or releasing the button at the right time, which sounds much less interesting than I think it ends up feeling. It's a game of watching, so that you build a model of this highly stylized natural system, and then you develop a way of responding to it, which is mechanically incredibly simple and straightforward." End quote. Accessibility doesn't need to refer to physical skills or experiences. It can also refer to theme and decision making. Jake Elliott talked about how he and Tomas Comanche intentionally avoided the player needing to prove their intelligence as part of the design philosophy of Kentucky Route Zero. He said, quote, we talked a lot about not having puzzles, not asking the player to be clever, not asking them to pass tests. For those of you who know Kentucky Route Zero, it's undeniably clever and multi-layered, but Jake and Tomas just take that pressure off of the player. This desire to not impinge on the player even carries through to the mode of interaction, since Jake's games are usually point and click, relying only on the mouse. He said, quote, I thought a lot about those gestures. What kind of posture do you want the player to have when they're playing your game? Do you want them to be in this posture and relationship to their computer that doesn't come up anywhere else in their life? I didn't want to disrupt their posture. End quote. There's a kind of sensitivity in this approach of bringing the game to the player rather than the player to the game. Marshall McLuhan's famous assertion, the medium of the, is the message, rings true of this group of designers. Almost all of them talked about the specific qualities of the platforms that they were developing for, both in terms of what affordances or possibilities it enabled, as well as constraints, what it disallowed. But what's more, they wove this back into the fabric of their design concepts. For example, Lea Schoenfelder talked about how the concept for a perfect woman emerged specifically in reference to the Connect. She said, quote, the main experience we wanted to have for the players is obviously the being torn apart by the Kinect feeling. The Kinect controller was part of the game idea from the very start. It was just the perfect metaphor for us. This analogy of feeling torn apart physically in front of the Kinect because you wanted too much. End quote. Ian Bogos' A Slow Year is similarly intimately tied to the Atari. On developing an Atari game, Ian talked about how space constraints led to the idea of four seasons. He said, quote, When I had four kilobytes, it's a standard sized rule. If I made one one kilobyte game, I could make three others. What kinds of things come in fours? There's not that many of them. End quote. Ian also pointed out that these kinds of constraints are always influencing our design decisions, whether we're aware of it or not. He said, quote, We think that we're using tools transparently, or that they're capable of accessing the real in some way. Unity has just as many kinds of quarks and foibles, and things that it is more or less conducive for facil facilitating as a creation tool. It's just that we tend not to think about it in that way. We tend to look at it as a given, that this is how you make things. End quote. Doug Wilson is inspired by traditional uses of technology, as paradoxically, these see what is non-traditional. Speaking about Joust in an earlier game, Button, he said, quote, both games work on the subversion of the technology, even beyond the gaming litter of people. Like, you don't usually play video games without a screen. Or like, you don't usually play video games that become like a sport where you push each other or physically interact with each other. 
end quote. Heather Kelly thinks about the qualities of the technologies we use in terms of the permission that it grants us to act in particular ways. She said, quote, sometimes it's not just about the technology as the interface that you're experimenting with, but also just about how the different mechanics of the game can get people doing different things that they may not normally do, end quote. <laughs> 